change the face of rock. We wanted to put together the band that would break every rule we ever saw. We were this band with makeup, and if you didn't like it, then step aside or we'll go right over you. They unleashed a spectacle on stage. The bass player spits fire. You know, there are bombs going off all over the place. They were bad boys. I was a 24-hour whore. All I ever thought about was sex. I smashed up enough furniture to, like, furnish, like, ten houses. Who harbored secret struggles. There was nobody in this band who wasn't guilty of being full of themselves. We were drinking a lot. We were partying a lot because we were unhappy. These are the stories of the band that shocked the 70s. Told by the people who live them. In a world where only makeup soul and conformity was a crime, our stages were taken over and turned into a circus. And so began a time of pure rock and roll, where only superheroes rain and hysteria was the name of the game. When Kiss ruled the world. We're all from four different backgrounds. I was from the Bronx, Peter and Jean from Brooklyn, Paul was from Queens. It's interesting the way I met Gene. Both of us were playing in bands, separate bands, with a guy named Steve Carnell. I was in a band called Bullfrog Beer in upstate New York, a college band. I needed to borrow some equipment, and I went up to Steve's house, and there was Paul Stanley. And Gene said, play me one of your songs, and I did. And then he played me one of his, and, uh, you know, we didn't get along famously. I thought we should be in a band together, but Paul did not like me at all. I think he thought that Lennon, McCartney, and Gene were the only three songwriters in the world. And all of a sudden, he had to make room for a fourth. One way or the other, we surmounted that. I think at that point, the die was cast, and we decided to, to move forward together. I was in a band called Chelsea. It didn't work, and I got really uh, desperate. And so I put an ad in Rolling Stone, a uh, drummer willing to do anything to make it. And I really meant that. We thought, well, there's our boy. I got a phone call from Gene Simmons. I thought he was crazy. And I had to meet him because of, of the questions he asked me. You know, am I thin? Do I have long hair? Do I like that? Do I like this? He said, let's get together. Let's meet. And I said, cool, OK, let's meet. So Peter wound up joining. And we started writing all the songs that ultimately wound up on the first and second Kiss album. Once we felt we had the music down as a trio, we put an ad in the Village Voice. Basically said, a band looking for guitars with flashing balls. I remember reading the ad, and my mother drove me to the audition. I had a 50-watt Marshall with eight tenant speakers. I carried it up two flights of stairs. As soon as Ace plugged in, it immediately sounded like a band. The first song I played was Deuce. And I just jumped up on stage with them, and I, you know, Rift out, man. It was wild. We had four people coming in with different roots, different influences, but with the same desire to succeed. We said, let's pull a damn and we're like, no one is going to come and see FK. And Paul Stanley said, kiss. So we're like, yeah, that's it. That, that's it. Yeah, kiss is the name. When we first started, we couldn't get any jobs. We couldn't play in clubs because we didn't do Hang On Sloopy. We didn't have a record contract, and so it was a very difficult time. So basically, we stayed in our loft and rehearsed. The loft sucked. It was cold. We had egg crates on the walls because we thought that would make the sound better. We rehearsed so much and so hard that I moved my bed in. I was a cab driver. I would drive my cab and leave it out front of the rehearsal space, do a rehearsal, and then get back in my cab and drive for the night. In 1973, the music scene in New York was very exciting. You had a lot of bands who were fearless in the sense that they weren't confined to male or female sorts of roles. The New York Dolls were big, and the Planets, and the Brats. Gee, there were so many great bands around. You know, we wanted to be a part of that. We'd have these rent parties where we'd have a couple of bands, and the place is packed and kids comes out and they're all in black with the makeup and everybody was just like, what kind of show is this? And I'm a looking for a kiss. They just blew everybody away. Someone called Gene Simmons would write me little handwritten notes every week saying, you know, we're a rock and roll band, you should really come and see us. We found the Hotel Diplomat, which was basically a cheap hotel right off Times Square, which seemed to cater to hookers, drug addicts, and people who needed a room for an hour with very crispy sheets. 
I put together a mailer with Paul, Kiss, playing at the Diplomat Hotel Ballroom. And I sent that out, must have been a thousand copies, to everybody in the television industry, managers, record companies, everybody. They were playing second floor ballroom and we actually had to step over broken stairs and there were holes in the floor. And I was just blown away with the guys. They couldn't really play that well, but there was something indefinable. It was just that raw energy. You could tell they wanted to be performers. So that kind of inspired me. And after they played, Gene and Paul came and uh, talked to me. Bill said that he was only interested in working with us if we wanted to be the biggest band in the world. And he said, I've never managed before, but if I can't get you a deal in two or three weeks, let's just split up. And he delivered. Within two weeks, we met Neil Bogart. Neil had been the president of Buddha Records, and he left Buddha with the idea of starting his own label, which became Casablanca Records. He actually wanted to sign us sight unseen. He was signing us because of the music he heard. Once he saw the band in makeup, he said to us, maybe you guys should take it off. And for a bunch of guys who didn't have a pot to piss in, we looked and said, you take us as we are, or you don't take us at all. The makeup was interesting. You know, Kiss didn't start off uh, that way. Initially, they were dressed in, in dresses and so forth. And uh, when the New York Dolls got that recognition, they didn't want to be a copy. We felt the dolls were very feminine. And all of us looked really strange in this stuff because we were kind of bigger guys. I'm six foot two and I weigh 215 pounds. If I put on something that looks like my sister's top going out on a date, I'd look like a football player in a tutu. We were thinking, this has got to go somewhere else beside the girl makeup. <laughs> We went one night to Madison Square Garden, the four of us, and Alice Cooper was performing. Paul and Ace on it ran all the way down to the front to just stare at him. We were kind of like kneeling down, trying to, you know, get as close as we could. And I remember watching the show, and it, we, we were just blown away. And that's what probed the idea of, what if we had four Alice Coopers, but different types of makeup? So each of us created our own personas. I became the demon. I wanted to be a star. I wanted to come out on stage and just take over. Somewhere inside me was a cross between an evangelical preacher, a game show host, and Elvis. I had a big, fat, black alley cat. For some reason, I started just looking at this animal and thinking, you know, I can relate to this animal in, in a crazy way. I was always into, like, science fiction. The whole idea of, you know, something bigger than, than this planet, you know, the universe and the whole concept behind that, you know? In the early days, the makeup used to itch us like crazy. I would carry a toothpick just to poke myself because I wanted to claw this stuff off half the time. We were also willing to do really anything to just make it. When I brought him to my office and we started working on the KISS show, some of the ideas were a little strange to them. The craziest idea you could ever come up with was not crazy in those meetings. You got nothing to lose. I brought in someone who spit fire, and he blew flames across the room and actually darkened my wall, right? And their eyes were just... They were open. They couldn't believe it. And, and the first thing was, well, you didn't mean that we were going to do that. I thought, he said, raise your hand if you want to breathe fire. So I didn't raise my hand because I didn't want to. And so all the guys had their hands up, and I wound up, okay, I'm the guy. We cranked out very quickly the first Kiss album and then hit the road. This meant a lot to us. This was important. We were a hard rock and roll band, you know, trying to figure out, you know, who we were and where we were going. At nights, I'd lay in bed going, wow, man, I hope this is going to happen. We had a long way to go before we were the band we ultimately became. Coming up, Kiss on the Prowl. It was guys kissing girls, girls kissing guys, guys kissing guys, girls kissing girls. The maid came to clean the room. I did her. I went to get a checkup. The nurse was there. Boom, did her. Next on When Kiss Ruled the World.